Greetings. I welcome those who are gathered in the sanctuary as well as those who are worshiping virtually today as we join in one spirit to worship our God as St. Luke's United Church of Christ in Independence, Missouri. A few announcements before we begin. A reminder to the youth that the youth group will meet this morning following worship. Lunch will be provided, so stick around for some lunch and have some fun. Next announcement, of course, we must wear our lay when we talk about the Luau Dinner. The Luau Dinner is this coming Saturday. Mocktails will be at 5.30 and dinner at 6 o'clock. Free will donations will be accepted from those who did it by a ticket in 2020. The original tickets were $12 each, $5 for children under 12. If you bought a ticket in 2020, it's good for this event, and you won't even have to have the ticket with you, realizing that's such a long time to keep up with it. But, but we will need to know how many to plan for for the meal. So please, if you're intending to attend the luau, make sure that you sign up on the list that's under the tikis in the hallway. We need that count so that we can have the right amount of luau preparation food. The Halloween party will be uh, during Sunday school on October the 30th. Children are encouraged to wear their costumes if they like, and they will be going trick-or-treating through the adult classes. So adults have some candy ready so that you won't be tricked. Reminder also that we continue to receive money for Puerto Rico and Florida after devastating hurricanes. If you would like to donate, mark disaster on your envelope or check or you can donate on the website or the app. Thank Linda Drown for accompanying the hymns today. Now from all the places we may be today, let us come together in one spirit as we enter into the worship of our God.
Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. In our worship, let us bring our whole selves before God, our troubles and our anxieties. God knows our thoughts and hears our prayers. In our worship, let us lay down our pride and arrogance and seek God's favor. God grants our petitions and gives us peace. In our worship, let us pour out our souls before the living God. God gladdens our heart and gives us fullness of joy. Now hear the call to confession. Let us approach God with a pure and sincere heart, confessing the deeds and distractions that have kept us apart from fellowship with God and with one another. Let us be mindful of the ways we have become self-focused and lost sight of community. We cannot undo all the wrong we have done, but we can be forgiven and restored to the path of kingdom living. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Ever present and living God, we confess that we often neglect to respond to life in constructive ways. We see suffering and evil, and we shake our heads. We see wrongs done to us, and we take offense. We feel alienation from you and one another, and accept it as our Forgive us and open our eyes to your kingdom. Let us see your power to restore wholeness to our world and to our lives. Amen. When we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and restore us to kingdom living. Thanks be to God. be seated. Let my friends come. We'll have our time with many. coming. He's crawling down the aisle. You guys can't see that, but he's... Yeah, baby woman is a baby. He doesn't know how to walk. Yeah. Yeah, he's on the way. He'll make it. With a little help from a friend. With a little help from a friend. Yeah. With a little help from a friend. Baby Roman's coming. Very good. <laughs> There's Roman. There he is. There he is. Okay. Matthew, could you stand up over there? Matthew, his job, I mean, we all hear him play the violin, but he has another important job. He's the conductor of the choir, and they're going to sing in a little bit, and, and he's going to conduct them. Matthew, in your choir, do you, did you just tell people to sing whatever they want to sing that day? No, we have to practice, and they watch me really closely. All right. All right. What if everybody sang something different? Then it would be a mess. It'd be a mess. Yeah, it'd be a mess. And uh, is it easy to keep everybody on the same note sometimes? Easy, yeah, with this choir. But with that choir, but really some cool. choirs, not some so choirs, much. It's a lot of work. Yeah, but it's easy with this choir. Well, here's the thing. 
I saw some of the pictures you guys were coloring in the, hi Roman, I saw some of the pictures you guys were coloring in the library this morning, and it was a picture of Jesus praying, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. I always need a spotter for children's time. So, so you're coloring a picture of Jesus praying. And Jesus taught a lot of lessons in Scripture, and some of those lessons were about how to pray. Now, praying, like I told you in the library, is just our talking to God, okay, just talking to God. But what if everybody talked at the same time and said different things? So I want us to think about praying, kind of not only talking about God, but kind of like singing, kind of like singing. And the trick is that God is our conductor when we pray so that we can kind of stay on tune. Because sometimes maybe I want it to rain and somebody else wants the sun to shine that day and it gets kind of confusing, okay? So we have to kind of listen to God and stay in tune with God and, and think of maybe a choir, maybe all the angels singing with us. And so praying is listening, is listening and following our conductor, following what God would have us pray for. Because even Jesus prayed that way, even when he was praying by himself, he'd say things like, let God's will be done, not mine, right? So think about praying and think about talking to God. And it's okay to ask God for things and to pray to God and tell God what we need, what we need. But it's also important to stay in tune with God's spirit when we pray and to sing with the angels and pray together, all together and following the conductor's lead, following God's lead, just like the choir is going to follow Matthew's lead. And God will hear our prayers. And our prayers are pleasing to God. Thank you, God, for giving us a wonderful gift of prayer to be able to talk to you. Lead us in knowing what to pray. And we pray to you today and thank you for hearing our prayers. Amen. Next time we're going to give Roman the microphone because he was a center of attention. As the children make their way to the children's table and more activities, let us go now to God in prayer. Holy God, we come to you in prayer because it is the natural inclination of our hearts and souls. We pray because we need to know that you are present with us. Your care abides with us. We come asking for more of your spirit in our lives. We come seeking a clearer understanding of your will. We come knocking for doors of opportunity to open. We come knowing that you are always more ready to give than we are to receive. We pray that we would begin to see the world through the lens of your abundance, teaching us to pray as Christ prayed, having hearts filled with compassion for all who suffer or are oppressed, surrendering our will to your greater purpose for our lives and for our world, committing ourselves to serve you regardless of the sacrifice. Let us lift our voices now and pray as our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, choir, and thank you to our conductor and Margie. The scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. Luke, chapter 18, we'll read the first eight verses. Jesus was telling them a parable about their need to pray continuously and not be discouraged. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him, asking, Give me justice in this case against my adversary. For a while, he refused, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or respect people, but I will give this widow justice because she keeps bothering me. Otherwise, there will be no end to her coming here and embarrassing me. The Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Won't God provide justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he be slow to help them? I tell you, he will give them justice quickly. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faithfulness on the earth? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus indeed had a lot to say about prayer. The Gospel of Luke offers us many of those lessons. Sometimes the lessons offered memorable and powerful messages that have stuck with us. For instance, the disciples went to Jesus in chapter 11 of Luke's Gospel and requested that Jesus teach them to pray. It was on that occasion that Jesus provided what became every bit as familiar and even a more frequently quoted scripture passage than, well, even John 3.16. It was Luke's version of the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer, our Father. When you pray, Jesus said, pray like this, Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. You might say that that was a lesson on prayer that stuck. These words are known in countless languages and prayed by Christians around the world. If it were a song, it would be atop the bestsellers. Wait, it is a song. Maybe you would even say that this is a song that our souls can dance to. And dance we have, weekly, daily, repeatedly. These words of Jesus' lesson on prayer transcend time and space, opening up the window of eternity, connecting us to the presence of the transcendent God, connecting us rightly to one another and to our world. But not every lesson Jesus taught about prayer in the Gospel of Luke is as clear or as easy on the ear. Some lessons have become clumps that seem to get bigger the longer we chew on them. Messages that seem to be even more difficult to swallow than to chew on. Messages whose meaning goes undigested by our hearts and our minds. This morning's scripture reading from the Gospel of Luke is one of those more unsavory lessons on prayer. It has been rolled around and chewed on by everyone who has ever taken up Luke's gospel, always leaving us with more questions about prayer than it seems to answer. Who are the characters and who do they represent in this parable? What exactly is Jesus teaching about prayer with this vivid but complicated parable? At first glance, the assumption might be that the judge is God and the widow represents all of us, her request to the judge being our prayers to God. But that interpretation quickly runs into some hurdles. The judge is described as cold and distant, having no regard for God, no respect of people. Even if that might be someone's perspective of God, it is very unlikely that Jesus would have portrayed God in such a harsh way. There are those who try to soften the interpretation of this parable, suggesting that this is who we might experience God to be when prayer goes unanswered. These interpretations tell us that like the widow, 
we must persist in our praying, even when God seems to be unresponsive. As Jesus saying that this is what prayer is all about, needling God until God finally relents and give us what we want. Is that what it means to pray continuously and not be discouraged? Well, the questions abound. Peter Olson wonders, does prayer influence God? Should it? If God knows infinitely more than we do about every situation, what is needed and what should be done, what can prayers add? If God can be trusted to know what to do and do what is right, what is the point of prayer? How do we know that we are praying for the right things? Prayers can be selfish, misguided, uninformed, always missing the bigger picture only God can see. So why pester God with information God already has, advice God doesn't need and desires that may be altogether wrong? Why not just let God be God and go confidently about our human affairs, knowing that what lies beyond them is in capable hands? That explain why some may see God as the uncaring judge, having no respect of people or the prayers brought by the people, ourselves included. Again, while it may characterize some of our experiences, a look at the bigger picture of who God is tells us that this just doesn't add up. Where is the compassion, the caring? Where is the God who hears the cry of the people? Others interpret this parable by reversing the roles portrayed by the characters. Perhaps we are the uncaring judge, and God continually approaches us to goad us into doing what God purposes us to do. Well, there is certainly such a thing as a burning in our spirit as conviction. This seems to not fit the overall theme of the parable, which calls us to pray continually and not be discouraged. Faced with this dilemma, some avoid the complications by abandoning the idea that the parable is even about prayer. They say the request is about justice rather than prayer. And the parable is a call to be relentless for the cause of justice, even in the face of powers that be, who are unconcerned and unmoved by the needs of the people. A good message to be sure, but Luke seems to be pretty clear that Jesus was telling them about in this parable was their need to pray. All of the attempts to explain Jesus' parable about prayer continue to raise more questions than they are able to answer. I fully suspect that this sermon will be no different. I will not be so presumptuous to suggest that I can do what has not been done by others who have attempted to explain it. But I will do only what others have done before me and raise more questions regarding the casting of the characters for roles in this parable about prayer. Our limited understanding and experience of God tells us that God is not without regard for people. After all, for God so loved the world, right? Even if our experience with prayer would suggest that we are up against someone or something which is unmoved by our suffering and our pleading, we have to know that our struggle is not with a God who is against us. But that leaves a question. If God is not the uncaring judge who is unconcerned for people, then who is? What if... What if the judge, uncaring and unmoved, is simply life itself? What if this judge sits on the bench presiding over physical laws of nature? What if the judge who sits in power is simply the rule of consequences and cause and effect? Wouldn't this be a more plausible explanation for why bad things happen to good people? Why natural disasters, even though they're often called acts of God, continue to wreak havoc on the just and the unjust alike? 
just as we know God, to be a compassionate God who hears our cries and who comes to us in our need, we also know life to be harsh, no respecter of persons, needs, or vulnerabilities. People age and die. Relationships are complicated and sometimes deteriorate. Change happens, and it's not always the change we want. Like the uncaring judge, life can be cruel and cold. Consequences can be painful. When that happens, what are the faithful to do? It's enough to cause you to be discouraged. Jesus may be trying to say, when life is hard and we find ourselves at the mercy of unmerciful circumstances, we must pray continually. That would make us the unrelenting widow in the parable about prayer. In the face of seemingly overbearing and unbending power, we are to continue to take a bold stand. Don't be discouraged. Continue to pray. Why? Why pray? Well, the uncaring judge in the parable, let's continue to assume that that role is being played today by the harshness of life has this to say. Won't God provide justice to the chosen people who cry out to him night and day? Will he be slow to help them? I tell you, he will give them justice quickly. Now that's what the uncaring judge tells us. Not faith, but life itself, experience itself tells us, assures us that God can and will come to those who cry out in their need. Of course, this is all in the bigger picture that Peter Olson pointed to. But even in the harshness of life, God is known to be merciful and compassionate. In the bigger picture, life itself tells us that God has a way of bringing light into darkness, new life into places of death, and hope into places of despair. While it may seem slow in coming, Divine grace comes quickly when placed in the long lifeline of life. Divine grace and knowledge always surpasses our limited perspectives. Yes, even life, as harsh and uncaring as it may be, tells us that in the face of unceasing prayer, life, the uncaring judge occasionally relents and gives in. The parable concludes with Jesus asking, if the Son of Man comes, will he find faithfulness on earth? Will he find us never losing heart, never relenting, always praying? Over the past several weeks, our congregation has been called and is responding to the call to become more diligent and intentional about our praying for one another. Our Facebook group page, Windows into St. Luke's, is being filled with prayer requests daily for those up against harsh circumstances of life and living. We are praying for them. Let us continue to do so, always and unrelentingly throwing open the windows of prayer, lifting prayers that stand us in the care and power of a merciful and gracious God, prayers that embolden us to stand against the seemingly unyielding and oppressing powers of life, prayers that let us rest securely in the assurance that in all the cruelty of life, God can and will provide comfort and have the ultimate victory. Amen.
You may be seated. We have been taught to pray to God for the coming of God's kingdom. The persistence of our prayer must be supported with our best efforts and our generous gifts. Let us join in God's humble work of compassion and justice on earth. Let us dedicate ourselves and offer our resources for the mission of God's kingdom undertaken by our congregation. I invite you to pray with me as we dedicate our lives and these gifts to God. Gracious God, we have prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. We offer these gifts and our lives as signs of our commitment towards living out of our prayer. Strengthen us with the Holy Spirit to move forward in faith and with enthusiasm as followers of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
In the face of life's cold, defiant harshness, let us continually lift unrelenting, unrelenting prayers, setting ourselves in the warmth and light of God's presence and love. Be well. Yeah.